He's getting closer and closer. I hope everybody is prepared. Not all of us are ready, but hopefully we're all prepared when that day comes. I want to lead us in prayer before the throne of grace to the one that we've been singing about here and, and the one that I believe has uh, made his presence felt here in the sanctuary this morning already. And I believe he's got a word for you this morning, and I believe he knows exactly what it is that he wants to give to you, and he knows exactly what it is that he wants to take away from you. These are times of anxiety and times of joy, but times filled with uncertainty, and he bids us now to come before him. You may want to just stand. You may want to bow. You may want to kneel. Whatever you want to do, come to the altar, but let's go before this one this morning. Knowing that we are speaking to the Almighty God. Almighty God, we are humbling ourselves before you realizing, realizing that you're up there, you're almighty, with everything that word means. You spoke this nation, you spoke this world, this universe, the stars, into being with a word. And you're bidding us to come. You're bidding us to come. You're asking us to come as your children and bow before you this morning and, and receive what it is that you want to give to us or, or what you want to tell us. Or perhaps those anxieties or whatever we're carrying around, guilt, sin, whatever it may be, Lord, and you want to take it from us right now. And Lord, you promise that we can lay this sin, our sin, our sins upon this altar. And you will hear from heaven and you will forgive us and cast those sins away to remember them no more. Father, what an awesome God you are. And Lord, I, I pray that you're hearing silently the praises going up within this, your sanctuary, for all the blessings, all the joys, all the things that you have lavished upon us, Lord, individually and as families. Lord, we don't praise you enough, but we praise you right now because you're holy God. You're our Father. And I pray everyone here today can call you and say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Lord, I pray that as you look at the hearts here this morning, God, you touch them in a mighty and a powerful way. Touch us all, Father, in a mighty and a powerful way. God, during these times, we need you. We need you more, perhaps, than, than most of us in our lifetimes. We're a world in turmoil. We're a nation in turmoil. We just remembered what happened 20 years ago and the thousands of lives that have, were lost because of of terrorist attacks, and now those terrorists are back in power. Not only a little sect, a little village, they're back in power of an entire nation. And their plan is to bring harm and destruction, especially upon America, Lord. So we pray for America. We pray, Father God, that you will wake us up. Democrats, Republicans, Independents, whoever it may be, God, wake us up. Father, we're in the midst of something that is happening. And what is happening is coming through your hand. And so, Father, may we humbly bow before you and acknowledge that you're God and we're sinners. And it's only by your grace that you don't take us to hell right now. Father, I pray that for someone in the sound of this voice that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would ask you to your son, Jesus Christ, to come into their heart right now and not wait, Lord. Father, for those that are here kneeling at the altar, those whose heads are bowed here in the sanctuary, God, touch them in a mighty and a powerful way. Take those things off that have been weighing them down. Just take them off, Lord, and, and don't let us try to take them back, Lord. Father, I pray you open our hearts for what you're about to do and say in this in this your message this morning, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.
God bless you, dear folks. A lot of things to be praying for. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope that you do, I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm going to continue this series uh, that we're looking at, a series entitled uh, Changing Times, and we are in Changing Times. I want to do this uh, second message this morning, and then next Sunday uh, I'll conclude this series um, on the changing times. And, and the whole thesis of this uh, series that, that I mentioned uh, uh, from the, the outset of it was that uh, the, ra the rate of change that's happening in our society today, the, the rate of change that's happening in our families is accelerating so rapidly that, um, that therefore the whole thesis of this series is to encourage you. It is, is to encourage you not to fear change and not to fear the things that we're seeing and, and reading about and hearing about on, in the news media, but, but to embrace good changes. God is a good God. We just sang that God is a good God and he is God. And therefore, he is good, not because of what we're saying. He's good because of his word, what he says. And so there are many changes that are happening in our life, many changes that have happened, and, and we need to embrace those changes because the good changes are, are coming from God. I was thinking, um, just thinking this morning and thinking yesterday as uh, we remembered what happened um, on 9-11 um, there in that field in Pennsylvania and then the two towers uh, there in New York City and, and the Pentagon um, and you heard this described as you were watching it it was a morning such as this just a beautiful bright morning skies clear birds singing and flying around hardly any cloud in the sky People were leaving their homes and they were going to work in the World Trade Center. They were getting on an airplane to fly somewhere. And just like that, their world, their world changed. Their life changed. I've often wondered how many on those, of those that were killed, how many of them went immediately to heaven or they went somewhere else. And there's no way of knowing that. Perhaps even when we get to heaven, there's no way of knowing that. But I, I want to do this series. So, and, and I've entitled this message this morning. And, and I think it's, a, it, it, I think it's, it encapsulates this thesis that I, that I want us to, to see in this series. And, and that is, we need to recover the cutting edge. Every one of us, and, and even this church, needs to recover the cutting edge of the power and change, God's power and change, that allowed him, cre that, that he created us and he created this church and his churches and he created this nation. And somewhere along the line, we, we and, and I believe many churches, I believe God's churches, somewhere along the line forgot to humble themselves and pray forgot to stand up at school board meetings, forgot to stand up against congressmen and, and write letters and do all those things. And before we knew it, our freedoms were taken away. But there's good things happening, and I want us to be able to embrace this. So if you have your Bibles there in 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, read along with me. It's a very familiar story, a very familiar passage. And it's about the axe head that was recovered. Beginning in verse 1, the writer of 2 Kings says, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. And then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. 
But as one was felling a log, his axe handle fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. And then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick, and he threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand, and he took it. Heavenly Father, God, may we reach out our hearts to you this morning to grasp the anchor that holds and to grasp your wisdom and your encouragement during these times, Lord. And we just praise you, and we just give you all glory right now for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, on the north side of Chicago, um, actually on Ontario Street is a, a McDonald's. And um, this McDonald's is very special because it's on the cutting edge, where God wants us to be on the cutting edge. And in fact, if you were to go to this McDonald's, it is so on the cutting edge that in, it has a 1950s decor there within the restaurant. It includes inside a classic 1954 white convertible. And on top of that, it, around the walls of the McDonald's are ads and posters and records and jukeboxes from the 1950s. And the lines are long, they say, that are just lined up, literally lined up, to go to this particular McDonald's. Because of what they want to do, it is theorized, they want to take a step back in time. Anybody ever want to step back in time to the good old days? And then we found out that perhaps the good old days weren't as often as good as we thought they were. And yet that this McDonald's has some very modern features. They're trying to, to, to give a McDonald's that has a simpler and, and, and a... Uh, uh, more stable uh, atmosphere where, where people uh, can just go back there and change to be the way things, for a few moments, the way things were. And yet McDonald's has some very modern features and services there at this McDonald's. It has a drive through window, has a home delivery service, and the delivery service is a 1955 Chevrolet station wagon, and it's painted red. You can change, charge souvenirs on your Visa card. There's an auto teller machine there in, in the restaurant for your cash withdrawals before you go and order food. There's a large variety on the menu, a larger variety than is on the menu of, of most other McDonald's restaurants. You see, and this was plain because the marketing analysts are keenly aware of what is happening. People are reacting to change. People are reacting to the intensity of things that are going on in their life, individually and as families. And many of them are reacting to change because they're frightened, because they're not certain of what's going to happen in the future, not only to them, but they're worried about the future for their kids and their, and their grandkids. And so the way it used to be is generating a lot of interest in these people who are seeking change. In a world that's changing as rapidly and as unpredictably as our own, it's reassuring to know that our God reigns, but our God never changes. And our God stands on his inspired and errant word that he had written for you and me especially during these times of change. And this is what I want us to see this morning. <coughs> I, I hope you take your outline out. And, and let me just, uh, again, give you the background of what we just read. <coughs> the school of prophets came to Elijah. And they said, Elijah, our rooms, our home is too small. We need bigger rooms. We need to be more comfortable. And so Elijah says, okay, you go ahead and go to the Jordan River and, uh, and we'll see what we can do. And so they go to the Jordan River and, and the Bible says that as they're 
they're laboring to accomplish the mission uh, to build this bigger place <coughs> for all of them. One of the guys becomes very distraught when he's working on that log, and all of a sudden, the head of the log, the head of the uh, axe flies off. And he, and he was very concerned. You could understand that iron at that time was a very expensive piece of metal. But more importantly, as he cried out, he wasn't crying out about the expense of that. He was crying out because this axe was borrowed from someone who trusted him to take good care of that axe. And of course, he didn't. Now, this poor guy was in great, and don't miss it, he was engaged in great work. He, this was Elijah, and Elijah said, okay, I agree, you need a bigger place. You go, and this is what we're going to do. And so he was engaged in a great work, but listen to me, he had a flaw in his activity. He, he was working for Elijah, working for God, but he had a flaw in his activity when that head of that axe fell off. What was his flaw? Well, I think he really had two. One, he wasn't watching close enough what he was doing. And secondly, he needed to inspect that axe and that handle for the condition of it. I mean, just like every day we check the oil and the in our lawnmowers or in our cars. I mean, we're very, and I'm being a little facetious here. We check our oil when the light comes on. We think about filling up with gas when that little yellow light comes on. And so they were on an important mission, but they weren't paying close attention. You know, God expects our very best. When he sends us on a mission, when he gives us a calling, when he gives us, he expects our very best, as you know, for his glory. <clears throat> and so, I, listen, there, there, there are too many Christians, I believe this with, with all my heart, that are so good at what they do. There are so many Christians that are just absolutely so good at what they do that they're doing it in their own strength and they're not doing it in the power and at the direction and in the wisdom of the Lord. They're so busy that they're not even checking to see, is, is this me doing it or is it God that's working through me to do this? And there are so many that, listen to me, there are so many, maybe some here that are living in the flesh and you're missing the power of God. The power that God wants to put into your life and every aspect of your life. Now, you've heard me say this many times when, when we were doing our Thursday night Bible study on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it was just absolutely, almost want to say mind-boggling, but it wasn't because from the time I got into the ministry and started listening and studying and researching. Uh, I knew that there were many, many Christians, many Christians, too many Baptists that were not familiar with the power and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so there are those who have, believers have the Holy Spirit in our life. There's no doubt about that. You're saved. But there's a difference between having the Holy Spirit in your life and functioning and living this life in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that became very obvious because not only the questions that were asked by the Holy Spirit, but why don't you know, why don't Christians know more about the Holy Spirit? And you know, the number one answer I believe was because when we were growing up, the Holy Spirit wasn't preached. It was the Holy Ghost, but he wasn't preached. God was preached and Jesus Christ was preached. And so many that don't know the purpose of the Holy Spirit are living this life, and just as I'm saying here, they're doing great work. But what could they do? What could you do? What could I do if we're living in the power of the Holy Spirit? God, fill me 
in your power, you preach this message. You build this building. You do these things, whatever it is that these things are that you may be involved in. And so there's some valuable lessons here in this passage, and, and, and we let go through them re relatively quickly. There's seven steps of recovering the cutting edge. What I mean is recovering the cutting edge. Some of us are, um, you know, that, that cutting edge really, I guess I would, re, would, would de, redefine it or, or define it as, uh, you know, when your knife blade or your, your lawnmower blade or some other blade, uh, it, it just gets dull. It just, it, it'll, it'll cut the grass. It'll cut the grass. But it won't do it neatly and it won't do it the way that it is intended to do. So we got to get back on that cutting edge. Again, for those who are doing great things for the Lord right now, and you're not, in, not doing it because you're not on the cutting edge of what God wants to use you for, then we've got to get back onto that cutting edge, especially during these times, these changing times. So seven recovering steps of, of the cutting edge, if you will. First step, it involves concern. Look at our text again in verse 5. But as the one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the waters. And he did what? He cried out. As soon as the man's axe head flew off, the Bible says he cried out. He didn't only cry out, he cried out in despair. I mean, there's a difference between crying out and there's a difference between crying out in despair. You know why I believe he cried out in despair? Not only because it was borrowed, but he knew that he could not do the job because he lost his axe head. You wonder why some preachers aren't doing the job anymore? Or why some preachers are falling or, or others on, on, in, in churches and on staffs? They've lost the axe head. They weren't careful. They didn't inspect what they were doing. The tool that God was giving, just as he gives us the gift, the tool to do what God has gifted us to do and places us where he wants us to execute his mission within his church. And so this ax head flew off. And, and notice that the first step when his axe head fell off, if, if your axe head has fallen off, so to speak, and some of you may have been crying out this morning in our prayers because there's something that you're, you're needing from God. The very first thing in order to recover the power of our cutting edge in the spirit is coming to a place where you lost it. Doesn't that make sense? Elijah said, well, show me, where did you lose it? And he took him there. Now listen, we do not know. Let me phrase it another way. We know, we know we do not have the power of the Spirit when we don't have the power of the Spirit. I believe that with all my heart. I know when I am, when I am preaching or teaching or doing something in my flesh, and I know the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's not the Holy Spirit that's doing that. And so, you see, we need that sharp, biting power that acts, that that ax head represents. We need that, especially today. We need it today. We need it not just to build churches. We need it to build each other up. We need it to build lives up. We need it to be hands and feet and voice that encourages people. And that says there is a way forward. These changes, some of them are good changes. And, and we need to be able to tell those. And so many of them are coming to church. They're not watching on television. So we have to go on that mission that God sends all of us on. Not go to the Jordan River, but in some cases we got to cross Jordan, the Jordan River. We've got to cross things that, that cause us anxiety or fear. And we've got to go share Jesus Christ with people that are hurting. 
Listen, this is huge. Without the cutting edge and the power of the Holy Spirit that is living in you, you will never, you will never, and I will never be able to serve God in a way that's going to glorify God. That's a pretty harsh thing to say, but it's, I, I think it's absolutely true. Don't we know when we are serving in our own power? Don't we know when we're not obedient to God? Yes, we do, because we have the Holy Spirit that's living inside of us. He's saying, Ted, 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 don't, don't, don't. Or Ted, do, do, do. We know that. That's one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit. Listen, not only will we never be able to serve God the way that he wants us to, but, but listen to me, this is huge. You will never satisfy that hunger to be better in Christ than you are right now. Every one of us has a hunger. I believe we all have a hunger, just as I scan this, this oil. We have a hunger to be better. Oh God, I want to be better. God, I want to serve you better. God, I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. God, I have a hunger for you. And God says, then do something. Regain your cutting edge. Sharpen your edge so that I can do these things with you as the ax, so to speak, that I want you to do. We all need that. And, and I'm convinced that, convinced that many walk through life who are lost. And they never have access to the Holy Spirit. And here's the sad thing. They don't even know it. They have no idea that if in one bright sunny morning, not 20 years ago, but one bright sunny morning today, that when they've left that home, They'll never return to that home again. Especially those who are young and invincible. We need to be able to tell them. Trying to live for God and not realizing. You know, some of us are running on a less than fully charged battery. And we don't know it because the light hasn't come on. We don't feel it. We don't know it yet. Well, let me tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, the light is on for all of us in this day. The light is on for every one of us here. Start operating as my church, God's church, in the full power of Almighty God. That's why I created this church. It's why I filled this church, so to speak. Why I filled this church with the different gifts so that we can be effective as a hands, feet, and voice that God our Father can send out on missions. Allow God to search our lives and, and just, just show us what he is, is able to do. And, and some of you already have, and, and you know that. There's a second step to recovering this cutting edge. And that involves confession. This is what our, our man that lost that, that ex head did. It, it involves confession. And, and notice that he immediately confessed. You know, we know this because we've heard this. You've heard it preached. You've studied it. You know the Word of God. When we sing, God wants us to immediately, not wait till tomorrow or wait till we get home. He wants us to immediately confess our sin. And, and confess, uh, when you come to a point and, and you realize you've lost your cutting edge, you need to immediately confess to God, as that man did, and say, God, I've lost my cutting edge. I know it. You can just feel, I know that I lack something, God. I, I can't put my hand on it. Well, what we lack is a relationship with the power of Almighty God be, until we sharpen that edge, until we go back to him, until we cry out to him, until we, and, and, and to, to admit to him that my cutting edge is dull. But, oh God, I want you to sharpen it. With all my heart, I want you to sharpen it. And so what does that mean? I placed this there in your outline. What does it mean? I believe it means that we have lost the path to the altar and the power of God. 
We need to return to the path that leads to the altar of God. If my people humble themselves and go to the altar before the throne of grace and confess and repent and turn to me, I will hear and I will heal their land. Now, that's a prayer for the nation. Well, guess what? We are the nation. And so when we pray that prayer, when we realize we've lost it, we go to the altar. It doesn't have to be this altar. It can be an altar in your home. But we're, we're talking about going to the altar where our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ is there right now. And I can just imagine when, when the Holy Spirit living in me and I sin, I do something I shouldn't have or didn't do something I should have. I can just imagine this. Hey, Jesus, you know what Ted just did, right? Or, hey, Jesus, I've tried to get him. I've been placing that feeling on him. You know, I've really been trying to convict him, and he's, he's ignoring me. And the Bible says Jesus is up there interceding for us. He's interceding for us to sharpen our axe, to be our very best for his glory, so that all his power can come down. We need his power right now to change lives in your family, grandkids' lives, children's lives, spouses' lives, schools' lives, nations' lives. We need that power, and God will do that when we just admit to him and confess that we're not where we should be. You know, come to the place, listen to me, brothers and sisters in Christ, come to the place where you honestly admit, I, don't, I just don't have the fire I used to have. Lord, I, I don't know. I, I just don't have that fire anymore. I love you, God, but I don't have that fire. Lord, I know I'm not as close to you as I used to be. Anybody ever feel that way? Everybody sense that? You ever said, God, I need your power operating through me? I know it's not, but I know that you want to give it to me. So God, would you forgive me? And when you do, when you go before God as that man did and cried out to God and immediately confessed, you know what's going to happen? That power of Almighty God is immediately going to flow through you like streams of living water. That's what the Bible says. Immediately, it's going to happen. And then there's, so there's, there's the, uh, the concern. We've got to be concerned about our, our status. We've got to be confessed. And then there's a third uh, step in recovering the cutting edge, I believe, and that involves comprehension. Comprehension. One of the reasons that the man was so upset, and I, and I mentioned this, again, is he understood this accident didn't belong to me. This man trusted me, and so he loaned me this item. Did you ever have any... Don't you feel bad when somebody loans you something and you break it? Don't you feel bad? Hey, neighbor, can I borrow your lawnmower? Well, sure. You're a good man. And what do you do? You run over a rock and you break a blade or something like that. How do you feel? This man knew that this was an expensive piece of equipment. That, that head was expensive. It was iron. It was valuable. You know, when I... Uh, Whenever I, I disappointed a boss, it wasn't because of what I thought I was, was going to be coming my way, but it was because I let him down. I let him down. He trusted me. He entrusted me with a mission, and I let him down. And this is what's happening to him here. The fact that the person lending him the tool was a sign that he trusted him. Well, notice here in your outline, when you're working for the Lord, you're operating with borrowed power. 
one of the late, uh, perhaps greatest uh, radio personality that ever lived, had this phrase. He always used it almost every, every day on his daily broadcast. Talent on loan from God. Talent on loan from God. He knew that the talent he had was on loan from God. And just like that, it could be taken away. We are operating with the borrowed power of Jesus Christ. The power to serve the Lord comes not from us. It comes from the Lord above. He's entrusted this power to us. I, I pray that God don't ever let me misuse or violate the power that you have given to me. The power to be a Christian, the power to be a preacher, the power to be a pastor, the power to be a husband or a father. God, don't ever let me violate that. I'm going to conclude this series next week, uh, so some of you may invite some of your friends. I want to talk about tithing. I'm going to talk about tithing next week. You know, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit. I cry out to God and I say, God, why don't they understand what you mean when you say if they trust you with just a little bit of what you have given to them, you will open the storehouses of heaven. Don't they see that the wisdom may flow? Don't they see that you say you will open the storehouses of heaven? Not with money, maybe with money, but probably not with money, but with blessing. Maybe somebody's praying for a child, a spouse, or somebody to come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And perhaps it could be because you haven't entrusted God, just a portion. Because God doesn't need it. He just wants to see your heart. Do you trust me? That's all he wants. So when we're working for the Lord, we're operating on borrowed power, if you will. There's a, there's a fifth thing here, a fourth thing fourth recovery, step in recovering God's cutting edge. And that involves return. In our text, what did he say? Return. Where did you lose it? And so he returned. He returned to the spot and he showed Elijah where he lost it. You know, that's what we have to do. Brothers and sisters, when we sense that the power is draining from us or we don't have that same power, that same wisdom, that that, that same being anymore to be effective, we got to step back and say, where did I lose it? Holy Spirit, where did I lose this power? Where did I lose this feeling of a close, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? And you know what? The Holy Spirit's going to take you back to where you lost it. And isn't that, a, isn't that a praise that the Holy Spirit will take you back where you lost it and he'll tell you so in other words, uncover the reason why the power has been lost. Uncover the reason. Search my heart, O oh God. Search my heart, O oh God. I've, I've lost the power. I don't, I don't feel the same way I used to feel. I don't feel excited about you. I don't sense that you're listening to me. I don't sense that you're answering my prayers. And God is going to uncover the reason why it's been lost. We all need to do that from time to time, especially in this day and age where the things are just in, coming at us in so many ways with such intensity. There's a fifth step to recovering the cutting edge, and that involves confrontation. Confrontation. There's only one way to get the cutting edge back. We must be confrontational with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've got we to gotta come face to face with him on our knees or, or some other way. In other words, we got to get serious about dealing with our sins. There is no sin that you or I commit that is a small sin in God's eyes. And we have to get serious about that. We have to get serious about not reading the Scripture or not praying or, or not sharpening our, our cutting, uh, cutting edge. In other words, we have to totally abandon all the human agency and power that is just from us. And we've got to ask God to fill us. Place all your work, place your lives in, in his hands and trust him completely. 
The Bible says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Now there's a sixth one here. I want to pick this up. But there's a sixth cutting uh, re step to recovering the cutting edge, and that involves change. I want you to turn in your Bible this morning. Just one, we only have time to look at one passage here. But look at Isaiah chapter 43. Just turn to the right there from Kings all the way to Isaiah chapter 43. God, listen to me, God loves, enjoys new things that requires change in our lives. I'm going to say that again. God loves to do things in your life, new things in your life and in my life that involves change. And there's a tremendous spiritual application here in, in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 43 and read with me in, in uh, verse 16. And Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea. Did you catch that? Who makes a way in the sea. Remember, we have talked about that in the Old Testament times, the sea was very frightening to people. It was very frightening because of the things that could come up, the storms that could come up immediately. And he said, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. There he's talking about the sea, the mighty waters. Who brings forth chariot and horse, <coughs> Army and warrior, they lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Now catch verse 18. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. How it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Let me just stop there. If God's doing something new in your life, and, and, and I believe it, that he must be in, in your lives, have you stopped long enough to, to perceive what God's doing in your life? And, and what you may be experiencing may not be uh, uh, pain or suffering or uh, because you did something wrong. It could be God. He said, I'm doing something new in your life. Just stop and, and look around. See what I'm doing. Ask me to search your heart and I'll show you what I'm doing in your life. <clears throat> he said in verse 14, uh, 19, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It springs forth. Comes right out of the field, so to speak. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You know what he's saying? When you've got your cutting edge and you've got your relationship with me, I'm going to do some things in your life. I'm going to change some things in your life. And you're going to absolutely know it because the waters, my waters, are just going to fill you. It's going to fill your heart. It's going to come right through you and, and the ministry that I've asked you to do and the things I ask you. And you're going to touch and refresh other people. In the last page of the Bible, <coughs> Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, Behold, I make all things new. God enjoys doing new things just like you enjoy doing new things getting new toys, new gifts for your children at Christmas, on a birthday, or whatever. Did you ever at Christmas give your child the same gift you did 20 years in a row? No, you surprised him. Something new every day. This is what God wants to do for us. So, And it involves change. And then finally, it involves commitment. Commitment to receive by faith that which the Lord will do. And that's what the last thing the young man did. He reached down and he took that axe. Don't miss this. Last thing that man did to get that cutting edge back is he reached down. Some of us need to reach down. Some of us need to reach out and take the hand of the Lord and the things that he wants to do into our life individually. I want to close with this and there's an article that I was reading about in, in a magazine called Fast Company, and it began, it began with a, a paragraph, and the title of that paragraph was Change or Die. And it said this, it said, what if you were given that choice, change or die? What if a well-informed, trusted authority figure 
said you had to make a difficult and enduring change in the way you think and act. If you didn't change, your time will end soon, a lot sooner than it had to. Then it asked this question, could you change when change really mattered the most? Can you change when change really matters the most in your life? Now listen to what they said. According to the article, the odds are nine to one, you will not change. You will not change. Listen to me. Even in the face of certain death, it's nine to one that you will not change, given all the facts. And he said, and, and Dr. Edward Miller, who wrote this, he's dean and, and chief uh, executive officer at John Hopkins University, studied patients whose heart disease was so severe they had to undergo bypass surgery. And he said, but many patients could avoid the return of pain and need to repeat surgery, not to mention the other course of their disease before it kills them by switching to a healthier lifestyle. That means I'd have to give up M&M peanuts and McDonald's. He said, all they have to do is switch to a healthier lifestyle. And Dr. Miller said, very few do. And he summarized his research on patients' inability or unwillingness to change their lives. He said this, if you look people after coronary artery bypass grafting, two years later, 90% have not changed their lifestyle. And that has been studied over and over and over and over again, and they still will not change, even though they know they have a very bad disease and know they should change their lifestyle. For whatever reason, they can't. There may be someone here this morning that needs to change our spiritual lifestyle. It's hard. Living a... Living a uh, a life that's going to extend our life. It's difficult in this day and age. That's one of the reasons people are lined up at McDonald's, not only to go back and, to the past and, and just to get out of the world for just those few moments that they're in there, but it's difficult for us to say, I'm going to be serious about this, God. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to do whatever. But there's a more serious consequence that we need to deal with, and that's our spiritual life. How are we doing spiritually? The Bible says, not Dr. Miller, but the Bible says there's only one way to have that cutting edge. There's only one way that you can keep that line of communications open and have that intimacy with me. And that's by being obedient, staying in the Word, praying, and seeking my face. And when you seek my face, you will find it. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? There may be someone here that needs to make an adjustment in, in your spiritual life. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe there's confession or... Or maybe there's just a cry, God, in some ways he's right. And I want to confess right now that I haven't been what you have gifted me and called me to be, but I want to make it new right now. God, do something new in my heart right now. Lord, you know I'm saved. You know I love you. You know the things that I'm doing for you. But God, there's something in my heart that's just not right. And I'm asking you right now, Jesus, show me what that is. And when you show me, I promise, I promise to be obedient and confess as that man did at lost that axe head. And Heavenly Father, there may be someone here today that, that can't call you Father, can't call your son Shepherd, but Lord, they want to. You see it in their heart. Or maybe that feeling of anxiety or 
something's just not right. Maybe that's you touching their heart and saying, this is the day, this is the time, this is the hour. Receive my son, Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's a heart here today that does want to be sure, that does spend eternity with you in heaven, then you simply pray, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Dear Jesus, I repent of my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I, I ask that you would take all my sins, God. I can't do it on my own. You have to take them all. And forgive me, Lord. Forgive me the life I've been living. Forgive me for the people that I've hurt, disappointed. And I believe, God, because you see the sincerity in my heart that at this very moment, you have given me a new life. You've made my heart new. I believe that, God. And I just want to praise you. I want to thank you. I didn't expect that when I came this morning or when I heard this message this morning or this worship this morning. But God, I thank you and I praise you. May I be what you have called me now to be. Father, there may be someone here today as we stand in just a second and, and praise you with our voices. God, it may just need to, as we're seeing, come to the altar and, and pray. Maybe someone, Lord, that's looking for a church home. If that's here at Pine Drive, then God, our hands, our hearts are open to them. We welcome them, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is, God, this is your invitation to make things new. Oh, God, don't let us turn away from it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.